On this episode of the History of the Chorus podcast with Curtis and Josh, we take a look at the black metal band known as Abigail Williams. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at IsSurviveByPro for news and latest episode postings. And make sure to subscribe to the show, leave us a five star review, and write us a comment on YouTube or whatever podcast service you're using. And if you'd like to see us do some live streams, leave us a comment, tweet us the keyword stream. Now, without further ado, Let's start the show. The devil is in Atlanta. <laughs> Army surrounded. In each watchtower, as the body of flesh lives, so the body of light lives. Welcome back to the History of the Course podcast, sponsored by the Church of Seven Track, where each and every episode, we take a look at the history of a band from the core as genre. I'm Curtis, and with me as always is my co-host, Josh. What's going on, buddy? Oh, not much. I'm uh, I'm doing all right over here. That was short. That was very short. Yeah, I, it's so we'll talk about it more when we get there. But there are more lyrics to that song, but not documented. So, like, if you went and look up Abigail Williams Watchtower lyrics, that's the lyrics. That's all they have for you. Now, I have found some of the lyrics because I don't speak the language. <laughs> That he's that he's screaming, but, uh, but I have sent found some more lyrics um, later on in the song, and we'll talk about that. But yeah, I always kind of found that interesting that that was it. I'm like, that he's not just saying that over and over and over and over and over and over and over. There's more to it. It's, it's got to be so. Yeah, what's uh, what's been happening, Josh? Oh, <clears throat> not a lot. Been living Doing that dream that thing. Huh? Doing that thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been doing that thing. Okay, cool. Doing uh, thing, just just living. Curtis. You, I'm just living. I'm just breathing, one second at a time. Did you? Uh, Do you have anything for a little? Uh, what'd you listen to this week? You are getting blurry as all get out. Oh my gosh, I'm blurry. Is it just me, or are you getting blurry? I, I am blurry. I feel like, yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was good. weird. Yeah, that was very strange. It's probably uh, about time you, for a new camera. Uh, yeah, probably so. Did you bring anything to the table, Josh, for uh, what you listen to this week? Hmm? Did you? Um, Did you? Hmm? Let me see here. I, uh... Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Okay. All right. You uh, back on the wagon, huh? I, well, I've been a little stuck, you know, <laughs> trying to close <laughs> out. Uh... I can't leave it. This chapter of things. Yeah, I mean, mostly um, on the back half a little bit, just because those are, I had only listened to them a couple times, really. Right. Um, Vaxus and Unheavenly Creatures are Vaxus 1 and 2. Uh, but, yeah. I uh, I also have to take a little bit... Uh, of exception with some things that were said on after hours. Let's hear it. Uh with this band. Oh, well, I just I couldn't I uh, the only part of the episode cuz I went in knowing that like okay, there's probably going to be some things that they're going to say that I'm going to be like, oh, "You have no idea." You know, like or something like that or oh, you don't even know the story to that. So how could you possibly get that? Um, the only thing that I found completely egregious in the whole episode, I'm, and I'm sure if I listened to it like right before this, I could maybe tell you a couple other things right off the top of my head, but, um, the only completely egregious thing that I heard was that, um, Eric thought the most accessible point of this band was on heavenly creatures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was a little confused on that one. <laughs> and I, I literally was listening to part of it about heavenly creatures. And I was like, for who? Like for well, what, what person would be coming into this album, looking at Coheed and Cambria being like, I like this. 
Yeah, I, the only thing I can think, I could see more of Vaxis 2 being more accessible for a wide variety of people just because it's kind of got more pop in it, you know? I feel like it's a good, like, mixture of kind of, like, what's going on now in music, but still having that coheed taste, you know? Right. So, um, I, yeah, I'm a little confused on why he said unheavenly creatures. I wasn't expecting that one when he said it. Of course, at the same I time, wasn't I wasn't either. expecting him to say that that was his favorite album. So that was also <laughs> interesting to me. Um, I, if I had to say one of these was most accessible, I would probably say No World for Tomorrow because it's the most oh, overall, yeah, like radio hitty. I feel like you know, yeah, I could agree with that. Um, and a lot of those songs wouldn't have to have any kind of censoring Contest. done to it or anything. Oh, like those are you know like feathers that's that's a radio song like for sure yeah. um but yeah i really just found that interesting i was like oh okay because but i think most people who you know are big kohi people would say oh it's got to be good apollo you know or it's got to be uh um silent r3 but i i think he was on the right track. If you're looking at this purely uh, objectively. Right. Then I, I do feel like he was on the right track there. Okay. Um, I need to look something up real quick. Okay. Well, why are you doing that? I guess I'll share mine. Um, Josh, I've got a problem before I share mine. That's okay. Kind of my little, my little intro into it. I'm a sick man, Josh. I've got the disease as well. I'm hooked. That, I had yep, a little taste yep. and I can't get rid of it. Now, and it won't get out of my freaking brain. Dude. <laughs> Which is hilarious because in after hours, I feel like I could feel you like downplaying this so much. Like you're like, yeah, you know, I've been enjoying it, you know, but, but slowly the fucking virus well, it, was working its way through your veins. Right. Yeah. Once we, once we got done with part four, and we got past him thinking, okay, you know, we're, I'm going to start focusing on Abigail Williams. And I, you know, was starting to listen to some Abigail Williams. But yeah, in my mind, there's still some songs playing from, <laughs> from like the Afterman. I mean, not even like like the old Cody stuff. It's all like the new stuff, like Afterman stuff and the Vaxxas series. And I'm like, crap, I've got the disease, bro. <laughs> I'm I know, I was surprised <laughs> when, uh, when I got in your car the other day and... Uh... You were listening to uh, Afterman. Was it Ascension? The yeah, yeah. Because okay. I like Ascension more than a Descension, but yeah, it's in my veins, bro. I've got the virus. <laughs> You're right. It's a drug, bro. <laughs> I get it now. I totally get it. What uh, what are you trying to research over there? <laughs> okay, I well, I remembered. The only other thing from the episode that I was like, uh, that, you know, I know I feel especially some kind of way about it if I say out loud to myself a retort to something that's just been said. Okay. And the other thing was um, when you guys are talking about Welcome Home and I think Eric was saying he was surprised that the rest of good Apollo was a lot softer, <laughs> you know, more catchy and kind of poppy and stuff when welcome home was like just so heavy, you know? And then I remember him saying that. And it, I thought immediately, I was like, I don't know what about that song that was in normal standard tuning made you think that this was going to be like a heavy album, you know, like this is, yeah, this, I we're just in standard tuning here. Yeah, I always do feel, I mean, it works with the album, but I always kind of felt like looking at the album as a whole, that song kind of sticks out more just because of like the, uh, like the way, I don't know, it's it's just, it's weird to go from that to, you know, where it's kind of like that marching, like in your face, you know, heavy, like head banging to you know, tense or e da, even da, like da, the song da, before, da, da, yeah, da, da, or even da, da, the song da, da, before where it's just like acoustic and chill, you know, 
into that and then into yeah uh 10 speed of god's blood yeah so it's it, to me it was always kind of like eh, it kind of sticks out a little bit not in a bad way but just kind of interesting that that's in that but i don't i good apollo has this weird feeling of welcome home and 10 speed feel like like those feel like the hits they feel like radio singles and then the rest of the album feels like deep tracks Right. Like those two albums kind of feel like they were written to be, you know, music videos or so. But yeah, I just I, thought that uh, was funny. I was like, when you said that, I was like, oh, I, I don't know what gave you that impression. Like, yeah, it's a slightly more aggressive song, but there's nothing going on there that's not, you know, they're they're not changing anything between playing that and playing the crowing, you know? Right. So. Yeah. Um, let's just go and call it. Forget Abigail Williams. This is part five of Going Cambria. Go ahead, Cambria. <laughs> throw out the notes. We'll throw out the stuff. We don't care. We're anymore. prepared. Um, I uh, I watched. Um, I think it was Drumeo. Um, Josh Eppard was doing some Drumeo stuff on YouTube, and it was like a big, like hour long thing where you know it's it's interviewing, but then he's playing through some songs of Coheed. And I told you before, we, we talked about how it seemed like some people were like really hating on his style. It was like, oh, he's too basic. And I'm like, yeah, I have no clue what you're listening to because it's not. And then you go watch him. And I told you that he's got like, he's got a very interesting like technique and setup too. So like, instead of like your normal, we'll play like the hi-hat like this, you know, if it's on your left side, you'll play kind of a crossover, you know, with the snare and the hi-hat. He goes full on left hand hi hat, and he's got the ride up here on his left side. Um, he's got a crash on his left side, or uh, uh, not a crash, but um, oh, I can't remember what they're called. But he's got another symbol over to his left side. Too. It's just a weird setup. But the dude is crazy. Even like his foot pedals, man. He's playing a single foot pedal, but you can hear some double bass in there sometimes. And the way that he does that, like watching his foot like twist and everything is weird he's got his hi-hat like if you look at the foot pedal it's like like perpendicular to him and he's sitting like he's got his foot sideways on it it's so weird looking but dude anybody that wants to sit there and say oh this, yeah he's really dragging them down he's he's such a basic drummer a moron go watch that video with drumio because that dude is insane my only complaint is his drum face is a little annoying but <laughs> yeah he does that he does that the, from uh i think it was the last like, supper DVD. yeah he's <laughs> like ah uh, okay oh <laughs> uh, yeah anyway uh final thoughts on coheed and camry and josh uh that was a good one um last supper did you ever get to see anything from that no not yet i need to go back and watch it I'm it's sure a it's solid on one. They but... do like a big super theatrical performance and they I've watched uh, some of their live sets. I want to say they like play all of Good Apollo. Um uh, and then when they get to uh Willingwell f Yeah, Willingwell 5. Um that's when they bring out like the Isn't it 5? I did. I thought there was only four parts. Five's final cut, right? Okay. I don't know. I thought there was only four, <laughs> but I, I don't know. I'm too much going on. Uh, let's see. No, there's just four parts. Okay. Yeah, okay, willing well four final, final cut. cut. Yeah. Okay. Um. I think I'm thinking of one through five on No World for Tomorrow. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, when they and during Final Cut, they bring out the giant uh, guillotine with the wings and all that stuff. It's, <laughs> it's pretty fucking sweet. It's pretty okay. sweet. Yeah. Uh, you've so seen, they went all out on that one, right? You've seen like the artwork for a Good Apollo that has that, right? Mm -mm. Oh, really? Mm. It was like the inside cover, maybe, or 
but it's a giant guillotine, like really, really long. And then it has like angel wings, like on the side of it. And there was Ooh. never really like anything that I saw from the source material that made mention to that. I don't know if that was supposed to be a part of the willing well. Like that was the thing that like cut the dimensions open or something. I don't know what the deal was with that. Hmm. That's pretty cool looking. Did you find it though? Yeah. Yeah, they bring out yeah, like, it like, kind of one of those. It kind of looks like a makes me think. Um, okay, this is gonna be dumb. Remember, uh, throwback to when we were kids, the never ending story. Yes. And he has to go through that gate. And Which it's one? The one two or two? Phoenix. One. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That's the only one I've ever seen. You didn't the see OG. two with no, super awkward two. teenage Bastion. No. <laughs> oh man. Teenage angst, terrible Sebastian. Yeah, terrible that's exactly things. why I didn't. Terrible. <laughs> Sometimes um, you gotta watch a fire burn, though. Chris. Yeah, no. you just gotta watch it burn. Anyway, it makes me think of something like that because it's got like two people on the side with the wings, you know, over there too, almost like a yeah. gate. It was uh, two sphinxes. Put your head through here. Never-ending story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did they shoot lasers from their eyes, or was pew, it? Pew. Okay. Yeah. What is somebody like the only the purest of heart can walk through or something? Yeah. Oh my God, their eyes are opening. <laughs> yeah. Didn't it still he try to it. shoot him? He might not. Yeah, it was you like walk up to it. And I think it was still a deal of like, oh, yeah, to have like a pure heart or something. And then watch when like the eyes would open, they'd start opening a little bit, and you gotta run real quick and like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there was all like those like night skull bones and everything all over the place. And like, oh, that sucks. <laughs> sucks for those guys. Sucks for those guys. All right, back on schedule here. Uh Coheed in Cambria, part five finished. This is our segue to the band we're talking about today, a tray you. <sighs> They'll be coming up sooner or later. <laughs> Oh boy! Then we now can talk more never-ending story. Exactly. There you go, man. We are uh, talking about a little band known as Abigail Williams. Okay, Josh. My extents. They've got five full links, I think, if I remember correctly. Five full links, and then this EP that we'll talk about here at the beginning. My extents of listening to Abigail Williams before this episode. Legend DP. And that's it. <laughs> okay. What uh what about you? Mine was Legend and this one, Shadow of a Thousand Suns. Okay. So we're both kind of um, walking in. Yeah, and I it's one of those things where like I'm not the biggest black metal person. Like there's black metal bands I like, but I would not say I have ever been the biggest black metal person. It has a lot of things I like, you know, it's got, it's got the scent. It's got the super technical aspect. Streck mark to Josh, <laughs> but, and they, Hey, Hey, and all along with that, they have a synth player. It's not just some random Joe Schmo. Right. And most of the time in black metal, it's, it's usually a synth player. It's somebody. Like, yeah. Yeah. They've got somebody on that. So right, that checks a lot of boxes for me, but, there's just, I don't know, it has to be, it can't be straight black metal. It has to be black metal with, like, some other heavy influences, like like your Flesh God Apocalypse, you know? Like, now we're talking. <laughs> now, now we're talking. You've got all the classic black metal elements, but now we're also going to kick it up a few notch, give you uh, some epic breakdowns. But Because, mm. you know, black metal doesn't really have... Like just yeah. straight black metal, they don't really have a bunch that's, of breakdowns. That's going to be interesting then, because they turn more towards straight up black metal on the second half of their discography. So that'll be that's going to be interesting. Kind of, then. but they also like I heard elements of like I heard like a southern metal type breakdown that reminded me of uh, Cancer Bats. Ooh. I heard um, you've piqued my interest. <laughs> Oh, what was there? There was another one that I had right on. Ah, oh, what was it? They are There's proud of their American like, roots. Oh, man. 
there, there was a like I heard like a like a two step break in one of their songs, and that's within these first three albums. That's oh, that's okay. somewhere on the second two here, and I think it okay. was on the third one. Well, I'm saying even like after after this episode, like the three oh, okay. that we'll talk about in the next episode, because they lose their they lose their synth player and they don't replace them after in the shadow of a thousand suns mistake yeah well you know <laughs> that's why i'm saying that but anyway um anyway let's get on into it josh formed in 2004 in phoenix arizona by guitarist ken sorceron bergeron who had spent time playing music in several local hardcore and metal bands as well as the industrial slash glam rock band victims in ecstasy that's um victims of ecstasy <laughs> victims in ecstasy <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah yeah it's that was kind of an interesting one when i read that i was like uh oh, glam rock okay uh sorceron would recruit members connor woods on vocals brad rips on guitar it's like he was born to play guitar right because his last name you rips. know where they are now but where are they now now <laughs> when you said the glam rock of anything of snakes glam and barrels. Rock. Oh my gosh. Uh we also have Bjorn Denov on guitar, Mark Kozobak on bass, and Josh's favorite thing. Ashley Jurgemeyer Jurgemeyer on keys. Slash drums. Nice. Let the ladies do it. Let the this ladies is do their time thing. Time tested, Curtis. Bleeding through. Winds of plague. Let's get, let's get a lady in there. They're gonna they're gonna stick to it. They're gonna get the job done right, and they're not gonna abandon your band after one album to probably go live in mediocrity. What well, I always wonder, like, what the hell happens to these synth players? Like they they disappear from a band, and then you're like, okay, well, what, do, are they working at Best Buy? Like, are they <laughs> what? Where did you? Now they're working go at Save after Music. That? What did you go to do? Yeah, I don't know. Interesting. Go to Influence. learn culinary stuff in uh, Maybe. Peru or wherever. <laughs> Maybe. That one Maybe guy so. went. Oh, uh, South that was Africa. Seo, wasn't it? No, that was um, uh, Comeback Kid. That's right. That's right. Yeah, South Africa. <laughs> what? Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Get the Have hell out of here. Influenced by a European metal band such as Cradle of Filth, the band would look into their own American roots to settle on the band name Abigail Williams, stating later, quote, the accuser is always relevant in society. In America, there was there were the witch trials, the Red Scare, and now terrorism. Everyone is always quick to point a finger. We do it out of fear, prejudice, and because of things we don't understand. So the accuser will always be present in society. Abigail Williams really stuck out to us, not only due to the above mention, but also because it possessed that iconic quality while still sounding very American. We want people to know where we're from, and that even though it may not be cool slash trendy, we are proud of our American culture. I love the name. I don't know about you, but I love the name. Let me just say, as far as black metal band names go, amazing. Amazing. The fact that they're an American black metal band, this is the name. Like, without a doubt, this is the name. You had to go, you had to go with one of the women featured in the Crucible. Like, that's as black metal pioneery old timey as we can possibly get so uh we're just sitting around talking about old timey black metal yeah that's good stuff with a name with a name to decide upon the band would begin to write demos to shop around to record labels six six demo tracks would ultimately be streamed on the band's myspace page as the band would describe the sound as having quote the groove and melody of Gothenburg style death metal, the face smashing breakdowns of the hardcore scene topped with the bombastic and epic approach favored by the frostbitten black metal hordes. Soon after posting on their social media page, these demos would be released by a fan as bootleg copies under the title, title Gallo Hill. 
Gallo Hill demos would capture the attention of Candlelight Records, which signed the band soon after commissioning the group to begin work on their first EP. But before things could truly get started, several band members would leave as Connor Wood on vocals would be replaced by founding member Ken Sorcerin Bergeron on vocals. Brad Riffs on guitar would be replaced by Michael Wilson on guitar. Mark Kazubach on bass would be replaced by Kyle Dickinson. And Andy Schroeder on drums would fill the full-time spot on drums, but soon after would leave and be replaced by Zach Gibson. This move would allow Ashley Jurgenmeyer to focus solely on synth. This is going to be yeah. a recurring theme, Josh, until we get to the newest album, 2019. It's just a revolving door. Besides the main guy, Ken, uh, it's a revolving door of members constantly. So, uh, What's, uh, what was her name again? Ashley Yurgameyer. Yurgameyer. Spell, spell her last name for me. J U R G E M E Y E R. I think she may, I don't know if she still is, but I think for a little bit there, she was in Cradle of Filth. Maybe. Or maybe I'm thinking of the, the lady they replaced her with. Yeah, she was in remember. Cradle of Filth for a while. Oh, she, okay. Ooh, she was she was in Orbs for a while, too. Okay. Um, yeah, it just says 2009 to 2011 was when she was active in some of these bands. Well, Best Buy job opened up. She's like, I can't pass on that. Right. I get, gotta get that Best Buy job, bro. <laughs> uh, mm, let me check her out on Discogs real quick. I want to okay. see if she did any like one offs or anything. You know, like guest appearance stuff or whatever. Um, looks like she did Cradle of Filth's album, uh, Darkly Darkly Venus Aversa. That was 2010. Um, of course, she's on Legend. Um, then she's also on a band called Hymnus Obscurium. I don't know who they are. No. Um, an album called Anthem of Darkness, and that was in 2009. Oh, she did Carnifex's Until I Feel Nothing. And that was in 2011. So she was in Carnifex weird. for a little oh, bit. Weird. Huh. Yeah, she's all over the place. I didn't realize Carnifex had. But I mean, there's like... quite a bit out there about her. So I feel like she's continually hmm. getting work. I don't know. She's not, it doesn't look like she's doing a lot of this anymore, but. Hmm. Well, well. Uh, well, she was Josh. the founder. Oh, she was the founder. Oh, okay, last thing. Um, this says she's she is still in Orbs. That she's oh, okay. currently in Orbs, um, and she was the founding member of a band called. Oh, good God, um, Ellie 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 Lion Ellie Lion. I think that's her last name or a nickname or something, too. Her last name is Jurgameyer. Right, but it's like her nickname or whatever is Ellie oh, okay. Elon, Elon or whatever. Yeah. Maybe that's like her solo or something. It just says founder of Elion, Elion and currently in Orbs. Oh, I didn't realize... Oh, yeah, alias is Ashley Elion. Wait, wait, hold on a second. Oh. Um, huh. I didn't realize Orbs had uh, bassist Dan Briggs from Between the Buried and Me. Nice. Hmm. Interesting. Anyway. Uh, let's talk about uh, 2006's Legend EP, Josh. Wanna? Um, yeah, but I also got to say, uh, oh my God. <laughs> I'm, I'm shouting out the goat, uh, female keyboardist, Alana Pachotnik from, uh, um, Winds of Plague. Okay. There you go. Okay. Move you gotta, on. Sometimes you got to decimate the week, bro. 
So yes, you do. You know? <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. 2006's legend EP from candlelight records. It was produced by the band. Three of the five songs were re-recorded versions of songs from the bootleg demo Gallo Hill. And the album was described by allmusic.com writer Alex Henderson as, quote, a perfect example of an American recording with a very Nordic-influenced sound. According to vocalist slash guitarist Ken Sorsen, the EP was only released so the band would have something to promote, explaining, quote, a lot of the songs are like older songs, and they felt a bit old. At the time, we were trying to make an album, and we just couldn't finish it in time for some touring. Songs from this EP include From a Buried Heart Like Carrion Birds, The Conqueror Worm, Watchtower, and the finale Procession of the Aeon. Um, okay, so the last two songs on this album, Watchtower and then Procession, if you go look up the lyrics, like using Watchtower as an example, all you'll have is just the line that I read at the beginning of the, in the episode. And each watchtower as the body of flesh lives or the body of light lives. And I always was like interested by that. And like, I'm, I'm always just kind of like, uh, that's kind of cool. Cause like you're leaving it open for me to like figure out what, what else you're saying. Cause I know you're not just saying that over and over and over for the rest of the hour or the rest of the song. But at the same time, I'm like, what are you saying though? And why are you not giving me the lyrics for that? You know? Right. So I've always kind of was like interested in like why sometimes bands do that. The other one I can think of outside of this band that does it is the chariot does that on. Um, I know they do it on music of a graceful heart. Um, it was the bonus track from long live. Um, But I thought that they did it to on. Let's see if I can pull it up here. Yeah, well, they do it on. No, no, no. They well, they do it on that song, but they also do it on the final track on "Long Live the King," where the lyric, the only lyrics that are written on or like published or whatever is "This language is dead." Whereas, like, I know that's not what you're saying in this song, you know. So, uh, just stuff like that is kind of interesting to me. But what were you gonna say? Um, well, I was just going to say kind of full circle here. So Winds of Plagues had a couple of keyboardists like over the years. Oh my God. <laughs> well, listen, so this will, this will come back around to Alva Gill Williams because Kristen Randall, who was their original keyboardist, well, their first one that like people know about. Who wins the play? Yes. Okay. She actually played for Abigail Williams for a while um, and they weren't touring and she had gotten a call from some people who knew Winds of Plague who were like, hey, they need somebody. And so she went to California and got with them. And that like around that time, that's when um, Ashley wanted to go back to Abigail Williams after she had like left for a little while. So she didn't go back or um, Kristen Randall didn't go back to Abigail Williams because Ashley, um, <laughs> Ashley Elias uh, wanted to go back to Abigail Williams. So she just stayed with uh, Winds of Plague. Gotcha. 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 Okay. But yeah. There was a connection even there. Like these people are, I've been through like, you know, a lot of the same bands. Yeah. I mean, we've seen worse like member changes, but I like it when Wikipedia gives you the uh the timeline and it's all the colors and everything. Oh, love oh, it. My God. Love that. God, dude. Some of these ones, I think it's um Norma Jean oh, is my terrible. God. That one yes, is but so dude, bad. The next one, the next band that we're doing, Barrier Dead, ridiculous. Like I decided when I'm doing the notes, I'm like, I'm not talking about half of these people, man, because it is too much, man. It is just too much. Uh, yeah. Why even? Why even mention somebody who was around for like a week? You That's know? what I'm saying. It's like I'm not even gonna. No. Yeah. Why are they even in your history? <laughs> who like, cares? You weren't really in the band. If we're being <laughs> if, honest, if, with on the timeline, your color is this big. I don't give a crap, bro. <laughs> yeah. 
why why are we just like name dropping at that point you know anyway um i've seen some people um uh oh my gosh what was i gonna say um i think i'm having a stroke Okay, call this. I guess that would be the word. Uh, metalcore. Do you hear some metalcore on this album? I can't hear you. You're on, you're on mute. On which one? On Legend. We're still on Legend. I don't think so. That's what I was like. Mm. It feels I don't... very black metal-y. Okay, do you think... But when you go from this to... In the shadow of a thousand suns, do you feel like it's a smooth transition, or do you feel they're different? It does feel different, but it's in a way that's hard to pinpoint. Kind of, yeah. I don't know. Okay, shadow of a thousand suns feels more thematic. Yeah, you know. Yeah, true. I. Again, like Legend was my only like true knowledge musically of this band. Because again, I'm kind of like you. Know, I was like, I'm not, you know me, I'm not really into, you know, like the black metal stuff. That's just not me. Um, but for some reason, Legend always stood out to me for, I don't know, five great songs, man. How can right. you go wrong? The but only when way, I, the only way I could see considering some influences of metalcore is that like like mathcore is a subgenre of metalcore so i guess if you like really want to be digging deep like you really want to dig deep i guess you could say that technically there's like some mathcore and like melodic mathcore in here on legend really If you're, I mean, if you're literally just saying mm. it in the most technical way possible, that like, yeah, these are technical, like this is technical as hell, okay. you know, and that's the only way I could see to maybe getting around to that. And like I said, I don't really agree with that. I think it's just, it's just black metal. Well, there's like sometimes, I mean, I hear some black metal on it, but there was like, there's a couple of times like the drums is doing almost kind of like that. uh i don't want to call it a hardcore beat but like for example like the very beginning of watchtower when they get going on into the first line of lyrics and it's the digga 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 it's like okay that's like that's almost like kind of hardcore sounding you know what i'm talking about yeah i mean they're it's just blast beats yeah but it's not like the your normal like black metal or death metal blast beats though you know what i'm saying a lot of times it's like when you really start getting into um uh, like black metal it's gonna be mostly like gravity beats and stuff right yeah so it's like i don't know faster for, but yeah I, for some reason like this album just really stands out to me whereas uh, from what i've listened to so far after this album from abigail williams i'm just not nothing stands out and i'm not really digging it you know yeah i hate it but i'm just like I don't, and I can't figure out like what exactly it is that I'm like, well, why do I really like Legend then? But I don't, I'm not a fan of like these next two, you know? Right. I don't know. I mean, we've already done, I think, we've, yeah, we've already done our episode on um, Flesh God Apocalypse. Oh, yeah, yeah. What, was there anything about Flesh God that like kind of drew you to them? Like any elements in particular? It was the thematic you know orchestral type stuff was more of what drew me to them okay or at least had me hanging around so you, you don't know? feel like you and don't she feel does like a good shadow of she, a thousand suns like I, I don't know it just doesn't stand out to me now in legend some of it does i mean she does a good job overall I don't, i'm not hating on any of her work um because i i am kind of interested I mean, obviously, we get a little bit on in absence of light where you don't get the synth, but moving forward past that in the last three albums, I'm kind of interested to see yeah, how how do they develop even more without that 
you know, since now that they built their foundation on. Because I feel like she made a good mark on Legend, mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, this is what we're going to do. We, we're going to have that synth player, and they're going to be thematic, you know? Right. But now nothing really stands out to me, though, on, on A Shadow of a Thousand Suns, even with that. It is very um, flat black metal. Um, yeah. I feel like... Okay, so you know you're listening. You're listening to "Agony" by Flesh God. Each song, as it ends, is like dragging you to the next song, to the next song, to the next song. Oh, now we're in the next song. Ba -la -ba -la -ba, ba -la -ba -la -ba. So it's just, right. I don't know. This feels very like one track ends, the next one starts, and the formula is like relatively the same. Which is, I, I feel like in a genre like this, like you're saying, it's like it has to have that continuation. And I feel like they made up for that on In the Absence of Light. Maybe not all the way through, but okay. I remember at times listening on In the Absence of Light and thinking, okay, I'll give them credit where I don't know where one song's ending and one song's beginning because it just kind of felt continuous at times. But I'm with you on In Shadows of a Thousand Suns. It felt very like start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, you know? And even they do that on, you know, Legend as well. But I don't know. And he starts to I, get I think, into he starts to get like his vocals definitely get better as they go on. Yeah. But he also like finds these weird pockets that he goes into with it where it's like almost Zayo y. Yeah. Like he like goes low enough that it's like almost there. Like right. I feel like usually he airs on the higher side on his vocals, but there's a few times like um so Empyrean um into the cold waste that one i feel like there's a few spots like in the middle of that song where if you just clipped that little bit you could tell me that was like a new zeo track or something it's and a new I, zeo track, like, yeah. yeah maybe <laughs> whoa okay <laughs> whoa. whoa yeah i mean speaking of his vocals i i know it's raw on this album but <laughs> god at times i listen to it on legend i'm thinking somebody's choking him while he's doing these vocals isn't that they? i i will say this, this is, is so the like, most <laughs> this is the most black metal that his vocals will ever be though right like god man they're just that... so raw and yeah i don't know there's there's that element of like oh yeah i don't give a fuck like this is yeah uh, you know i'm just out here doing it man yeah. well you like i always think on the it's kind of the break part on watchtower where it kind of like the music kind of slows down but he's still doing his vocals and it's very like high pitch but very kind of gurgly and like like i said that sounds like somebody's like choking him while he's doing it. it's like i've always been like ooh, ooh, right ooh, man oh that's nice <laughs> oh i like that <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but anyway yeah, I don't know. It's this one always kind of stood out to me. Um, I love all five songs, and they've always just kind of been um, catchy, and they get stuck in my head at times. But even though I don't know what he's uh, what he's saying half the time, but that's all right. All right, that's uh, their first EP, 2006's Legend EP from Candlelight -like Records. The band was off and running as they headed out on tour in support of their new EP with Dark Funeral and Enslaved. But just as the party was starting, the band announced they were splitting up. And that's the end of the episode. All right, everybody have a good night. We'll see you in the next episode for a brand new band. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, although they were splitting up, not everyone declared that the band was breaking up as frontman Sorceron later claimed that rather than being in a permanent split, he referred to it as a, quote, premeditated hiatus. Ooh, fancy. During this time of premeditated hiatus, several members would start new bands, but only several months after splitting up, several members would decide to return to Abigail Williams and pick up where they left off. This revival included Ken Sorceron Bergeron on vocals slash guitar, Bjorn Denov on guitar, Michael Wilson on guitar, Thomas Plaguehammer on bass, Ashley... Ashley! on keys <laughs> and while zach gibson on drums would return for a brief touring stint he would be replaced by samus Pulsolini. possibly seamus yeah yeah good enough seamus hey seamus yeah with a new sense of purpose the band was ready to begin writing and recording material for their debut album their full-length 
2008's In the Shadow of a Thousand Suns from Candlelight Records. Produced by James Murphy, who has done work with Cancer, Obituary, Death, Testament, and many other bands, as long er, as well as <laughs> the uh, what? Cancer, <laughs> Obituary. Yeah, I was like, I was, I was typing this, and I was like, this sounds weird, man. He's done work with Cancer. Bill, he's a docker. <laughs> I've worked on Cancer, man. Uh, the uh, lead vocalist Ken Sorsen also did work on this album too. Uh, this is the final album for <laughs> this is the final album for everybody in the band except for Ken. Okay. Oh my god. <laughs> so no more. Say goodbye to Bjorn, Danov, Michael Wilson, Thomas Blake Hammer, Seamus, and uh well Ashley for the time being. She'll come back. Ashley, no for, uh, <laughs> for one more album. But say goodbye to all those people for now. Uh this album would also feature enslaved drummer term <laughs> that sounded <laughs> <laughs> enslaved <sounded> drummer <laughs> okay the drummer of the band enslaved there you go let's say it that way sounds like uh sounded bad uh would feature the band <laughs> we'll be right back that'd be the perfect time for it man uh, <laughs> uh okay let me redo that one his album would also feature drummer from the band Enslaved, uh, Term Torson, on several songs in place of Seamus Pocelli, as he would leave during the recording process. This album peaked at number 35 on the Billboard's Top Heat Seekers chart. Re released. This Jesus freak out. Yeah, man, here we go. It was also re released as a deluxe edition in 2010, featuring unreleased tracks. Here we go, Josh. Alex Henderson of Jesus Freak. I don't know. I got, no, I'm just Whoa. <laughs> That'd be a little strange, but okay. Yeah. I don't know. Covering they should make those going. guys. Those guys should make. They should be forced to like review albums like that, man. That would be hilarious. Just, yeah, just looking good. Uh, no mention of Jesus here. Sat through the album wondering where's Jesus going to be at, man. <laughs> Uh, Alex Henderson of AllMusic.com wrote in his review of the album, quote, Some bands can go through numerous lineup changes and still keep the same sound year after year. But for others, lineup changes mean changing their sound. And in a shadow of a thousand suns, Abigail Williams' first full-length album is definitely a change from the EP Legend. This 2008 release isn't an ultra-radical departure from Legend, but Abigail Williams still focus on extreme metal, and it isn't as though they reinvented themselves as an emo band or a dance pop group. I would love to see that. Would love to hear that. But while Legend is best described as a death metal slash black metal with metalcore influences, In the Shadow of a Thousand Suns is more in the symphonic black metal vein. Abigail Williams have dropped the metalcore influences and greatly decreased the death metal influences and an American band that was American sounding on legend becomes even more European sounding on in the shadow of a thousand suns. And maybe that's what, I, that's kind of a feeling that I have is it does, it does feel more European on this and going forward where yeah, at their legend DP did feel more kind of that American route, you know, I don't know. Uh, much of the album is flat out vicious, but this time melody is a higher priority. And while the material on this 46 minute CD is derivative, it is also undeniably well executed. Keyboardist Ashley Jurgemeyer, a rare example of a female musician playing black metal, adds a lot in the way of dark atmospherics, and lead singer slash guitarist Ken Sorceron provides a nasty black metal rash that could peel paint. Nice. In the Shadow of a Thousand Suns doesn't pretend to point black metal in any new directions, but it's a respectable outing and shows how enjoyably well American black metalers can emulate their European counterparts when they put their minds to it. Songs on this album include I, The World Beyond, Acolytes, A Thousand Suns, Into the Ashes, Smoke and Mirrors, A Semblance of Life, Empyrean, Into the Cold Waste, Floods, and the finale. 
Departures with bonus tracks from the Deluxe Edition, I Am God, In Death Comes the Great Silence, Waiting for the Rain, Infernal Divi Divide, and the finale, a demo version of Floods. Well, we talked about it a little bit already, Josh, and I think you're on mute, by the way. Uh, but what do you think of 2008's In the Shadow of a Thousand Suns? I'll tell you. Um, I'm dying to hear it. <laughs> I mean, we talk about review, it in the Shadow of a Thousand Suns. I've been dying to talk about a Thousand Suns. The review had the right of it. This is a very symphonic black metal album. Um, so far, from what I've heard, this is kind of like the epitome to me of Abigail Williams. Like this is this is a sweet spot. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I feel it's it's got everything you want from a black metal album, but it also has like those weird little elements, you know. It, it's got it's got uh, some. I think I think the two step stuff was on the next album, and I uh, that might have been like the breakdown too that I thought felt kind of cancer bats esque. Um. But there's, I don't know. There's there's a lot of weird stuff on here. You have like a weird synth break that's like super long through, I believe, floods, um, and then departure ends with, um, well, not ends ends, but it's got the um, weird acoustic stuff like in the middle, um. And it sounds like who's doing synth on this album? Uh, Ashley. Okay. It sounds like she was doing some backing vocals through there. No one surprised me. So, no, I mean, why not? You got a female in the band. Get her to do some backing vocals too for effect. These are my favorite kind of album covers too, where I'm like, I have no idea what's happening. Makes me think of uh, when I look at this one, it kind of makes me think of uh, Roots Above, Branches Below. Uh, Devoris Prada. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's you know. It's the I mean, minus skies. the minus the logo, you know, the black metal logo. <laughs> right. Take that part out. Yeah. But yeah, I always think of that when I see this album cover. It's kind of that style, you know. Yeah. Uh, color tone and everything, but yeah, this makes yeah, me no, think no. of. Um... <laughs> Oh, now I'm not going to be able to remember. I brought up this their song to you before called Circle of Nine. Oh, um. <laughs> Don't look it up, but I'm going to look it up. Oh, man. No, 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 no. Uh oh yeah okay I remember that one. You got this. Focus. <laughs> oh hold on, let me see. Dude, you know it's terrible. My mind yeah. keeps wanting to say "Ghost Inside," and I'll tell you why. <laughs> Is because their album. Um... Oh what the oh, shit! I can't remember the name of it. The one with the mountain on it. Oh, this yeah, band yeah. Um, has an album cover that looks almost the same. What the heck? Did it have a Wikipedia page? I like a Wikipedia oh page, my God. please. Okay, you really? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, in a way. Their first album makes me think their first album. Uh oh. I guess it's well, okay. Their first album is the uh, is Circle of Nine, right? Uh, the album artwork makes me think of a little bit. It's just because it's a house and it's dark, and they throw in the disfiguring the, um, the goddess. Yes, you throw in the um, uh, the way the uh, the name is drawn up. It makes me think of uh, Impending Doom's first album. 
What's oh, it called? With the church. Yeah, what's it called? Nailed Dead Risen. Yeah, Nailed Dead Risen. Yeah, yeah, kind of that dark tone like that. Anyway. No. <laughs> Um, oh, have you, did you did you listen to any disfiguring the goddess? No. Okay. Yeah, I I feel like that's a little outside for you. Yeah. Even I me, can just like, look at. I, it. I don't know. I've listened to all of it. Well, I, most of their stuff. I don't know. Every now and again, I'll get on a kick with like a band like that, where I'm like, oh no, I'll listen to all of their stuff and go through it like a few times, but. This figuring the goddess, yeah, I don't remember why they came around to me. And this was around the time Circle of Nine came out, but what genre are they? Like freaking like sludge core. Oh. <laughs> hmm. Um maybe okay. Yeah, I don't know. What I mean, what do they have it listed as? <laughs> oh man. I feel like that uh that meme uh I don't remember what it was what it was from, but the guy sitting in the in the uh chair and it's like the he's getting like blown back or whatever. You know what I'm talking about? No. Oh, okay, never mind. You just looked like De Niro to me. <laughs> this is my impression, uh, impersonation of Robert De Niro listening to uh, Disfiguring the Goddess. <laughs> it's pretty good. Uh, all right, yeah. Yeah, anything else, Josh, for uh, 2008's In the Shadow of a Thousand Suns? Um no. Are you listening to Disfigure Disfigure the Goddess? Well, I'm trying to I'm trying to pull myself out of doing this. What do you mean? Disfiguring the goddess. I'm like, you know, just checking out a bunch of stuff about them now. Now is like, not no, the time, Josh. It. Now's not the time. <laughs> We're almost done. Uh after release of their new album, the band would see massive lineup changes. Shocking. As Ken Sorceron would be the only member to stay, bringing in new members Ian Jekyllis on guitar, Alana Pocho Snickney, whatever, on keys, <laughs> and while Zach Gibson on drums would return on drums. Yeah, he would return. Uh, here's one thing I noticed when I was doing my notes. It's like you start out at the very beginning of their, of their history. You know, you got Ken Bergeron, you've got, you know, Michael Wilson, you got... You know, Brad Riffs, you know, Kyle Dickinson. Slowly but surely, he is gaining like these European names left and right. And it's just getting worse and worse. I feel like I was thinking, like, <laughs> where is he finding these people? I don't are, aren't know. They in in like, America. Aren't they in like Arizona or something? Where yes. are they? So it's like, where are you finding these people? <laughs> He's importing them. You get over here. Weren't I'll pay they, for your green card because I know now he's in Washington, but were they in Arizona? Yes, yeah, that's where they started. <laughs> were they finding all these people with these like Nordic names in Arizona? They like the heat. They like that dry heat. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> Sidebar: Have you seen a trailer? I haven't watched this trailer yet, but I heard about it. Have you seen a trailer for a movie called The Carpenter or The Carpenter's Son? Uh-uh, no, what? It's apparently, Curtis, I have not watched the trailer yet. It's apparently supposed to be... It's it's like a Viking kid is, like, abandoned or left or something. What and this world? carpenter, like, takes him in and, like, raises him. And the twist is the carpenter is Jesus. Because everybody knows... The <laughs> biblical events in Vikings it take a place at the same time. Okay. I also weird. heard that it takes a weird focus on like, like the Viking guy doing this weird like fighting pit type stuff. I heard it described as a uh, Viking MMA. Yeah, I was gonna say the first little clip was like it looked like MMA. 
this is weird. Yeah, this is like I, Viking MMA. I've been wanting to watch the trailer because I know it's going to be horrible, but. I guess it already came out. This is 2023. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, it's weird. Anyway, moving on. Sidebar. <laughs> I just had over. to bring that up. <laughs> Thank you. I, did, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so now we got, uh, got new members. Touring would commence after the lineup changes, and an EP entitled Tour 2009 EP would also be released. But as the year turned to 2000, to, 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 to 2010, more changes would occur. <laughs> oh my God. As Zach Gibson on drums would once again leave the band, uh, which would leave the band, uh, replacing him with Ken Bedeen and Alana whatever the heck on keys would depart from the band, leaving the group to decide not to replace the vacant key spot, which in turn would reflect in the sound of their next album, 2010s in the absence of light from candlelight records produced by Peter. Oh God. Tat grin. Good enough. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a T and a G and a T. All next to each other with another G after that. I'm not even going to try. He's done work with the band The Abyss, Amon Amarth, Hypocrisy, and many others. And vocalist Ken Sorcerin also contributes producing on this album. This is the only album for drummer Ken Bedeen and is noted as a departure from the band's previous symphonic black metal sound for a more traditional black metal sound. Excuse me, I had to sneeze. Author Steel Drum of AngryMetalGuy.com wrote a review on the album stating, quote, Symphonic Black Metal, a genre brought with many a trap, snare, and pitfall, awaiting the unwary band that wants to go down this grim and icy road. Overproduction, bloating, too much keyboard, not enough keyboard, all can bring the metallic symphony to a halt faster than a black metal miser can frown. Even if one avoids all these dangers, the music must be interesting and compelling at its core, or trouble ensues. It's that last nagging little issue that drags down in the absence of light. The sophomore album by Abigail Williams. Before we go any further, it should be made clear Abigail Williams is a professional, proficient, three-piece black metal band, and we will forgive their deathcore beginnings. And they have the musical chops to contend in this genre. There are moments across in the absence where everything gels and things work very well. Sadly, across the eight tracks offered, there just aren't enough of these moments to elevate the album to the level of their peers. This is a pity because Abigail, Abigail Williams borrows liberally from these very peers for their style and delivery. Throughout In the Absence, in the absence of Light, you'll hear definitive echoes of Demure Burger. The atmosphere and tempos. Cradle of Filth vocalist in Bergeron sounds eerily similar to Danny Filth on many tracks, and even Burkniger. There are many. There are the blast. I know. <laughs> there are the blast beats. <laughs> do, 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 Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there are the blast beats and the keyboard-drenched atmospherics one expects of the style and the music lurches between Frenzy and Moroso as it should. And fans of symphonic blackness will hear all the things they expect and want. However, the problem that plagues in the absence of light again and again is that the music isn't very compelling or interesting and frequently comes across as bland and uninspired. That's a problem. That's a problem. It's a big problem. The problem tracks, with this album is generally that she's not very good. That's basically <laughs> what that guy was saying. It tracks like Infernal Divide, Capture a Frigid Feeling and, and Ambience. And you can hear the potential these guys have when it all comes together. Likewise, lead track Hope, The Great Betrayal, has some quality moments, especially towards the back end of the song with wolves howling in the background. However, the balance of the album floats by without much to take notice of. 
It's generally a bad sign when a reviewer has to keep going back to the beginning of a track because his mind wanders away and the song plays through without any impression whatsoever. Unfortunately, this was occurring with most of the tracks here, especially the last three, which just meander by without grabbing you. There isn't that it factor here that makes music memorable. This isn't the fault of Peter whatever production, which is clear, powerful, and punchy enough without being too clear and too clean. This is plainly an issue with the boys in Abigail Williams needing to shore up their compositional skills to make the music more interesting and memorable. With the musical ability clearly in place and capable of delivering, it now falls to these gentlemen to work on writing and crafting songs that have more power and appeal. Until they accomplish this, Abigail Williams will be relegated to the second or third chair in the Black Metal Symphony depth chart. How do you get to be the next Cradle of Filth? Practice. 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 Songs on this album include Hope, The Great Betrayal, Final Destiny of the Gods, The Mysteries That Bind the Flesh, Infernal Divide, In Death Comes the Great Silence, What Hell Awaits Me Here, An Echo in Our Legends, and the finale Maldiction, uh, with a bonus track, a cover, Josh's favorite thing from a band, uh, of ministry song Psalms 69. All right, Josh, in the absence of light, what say ye? I was just about to ask, I was like, is that wolves in the background of Ooh, Hope the yep. Great Betrayal? Yep. That was actually kind of cool. That's it's pretty sick. Yeah. I feel like it's a good oh. fit for black metal bam. Right, yeah. Yeah, you gotta go that route. Um, the absence of the synth is felt. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> the, and sure. the absence of synth. <laughs> yeah, for That's sure. That's what they should have called the album. In the it's absence probably like the working synth. title. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. Um, I totally forgot about this, but I saw him one time. Um, Live? I was... No, okay, so I was going to a show at Rudy's house. Um... Did you ever go to any shows at Rudy's house? No, nope, but you're familiar with Rudy's house. No, but I'm familiar with Rudy. Oh, you know didn't Rudy, li- though? Wait, didn't he li- wait, wait, hold on a second. Didn't he live in, like, a nice neighborhood? Yeah. Or I, I mean, relatively. It was a quiet yeah, neighborhood. Know. Okay, anyway, go ahead. Except on nights where there were shows at Rudy's house. <laughs> um. Then everybody hated Rudy. All right. Uh... Yeah, I was Rudy, Rudy was and... a good boy. He lived was... a quiet life, <laughs> except for the nights where there were concerts at Rudy's house. Nobody liked Rudy on those nights. We were going to a show at Rudy's house, and I I feel like it was a show we found out about kind of late. And I don't remember who it was, but when we got there, Abigail Williams was like taking their stuff out to the cars, and they had opened. So... What year was this? <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to find my mute button. <laughs> oh, dear God. Maybe somewhere in between 2008 and 10. Okay. Hmm. So, Interesting. But yeah, I just remember getting there and being like, oh, man, like who, who just played? They're like, oh, Abigail Williams. And I remember seeing him like walking in and out past me like carrying crap but i remember you (laughs) um Um. musically i would have to disagree a little bit i feel like they are getting tighter like it's getting better but well you here's the thing about you lost your sin Not that that was like the backbone or like the main focus, but I would hope you would get better musically by losing something like that, you know? Right. So. Biggest thing about this album is just like that lack of synth. Like you, you really feel In the absence of synth. And it feels less like a black black metal album and it feels more like a deathcore album kind of okay. 
Hmm. And not like fully, like I'm not saying this is a deathcore album, but it is leaning more deathcore. Right. I get what you're saying. Without though, yeah. the synth. So. Without it. Okay. Yeah, I I mean I agree with the the reviewer of and I said it earlier in the in the episode too, just nothing like on these two full length albums, nothing really like pops out to me it doesn't give me the i don't i don't get the coheed virus nothing gets stuck in my head you know personally no and i mean yeah that's this is just not catchy music you know right. what i mean right but i dude i can i can find it any in any genre i mean heck some of those legend songs from legend get stuck in my head sometimes you know like i was yeah. saying earlier so i mean there are some stuff across genres that do get stuck in my head that are catchy whether it's music or whatever but yeah i feel like we're just kind of i mean listening to this album i'm like okay like yeah this is like flat like it's cohesive because like i said there's transitions whereas the last album was not but it just feels like eh, it's just another you know inter genre name right here type album you know there's yeah there are like zero hooks yeah. Um and it definitely can be done. Think of okay, I'm gonna say the faceless Curtis. And what's the first song that you think of? You're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> oh man, I thought for sure you'd say uh pestilence. Pestilence was like their biggest song. It was on uh um, I don't know if I've ever first listened. Album, All Autopsy. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever listened to um with every hour, Curtis, Faceless. more victims fall. Oh, oh, oh my. But there's a bunch of, there's tons of hooks in that album. And it's super technical, like very black metal-y feeling. But there's there's some fucking hooks. Um, I'm, you know, let's say a, a true black metal band, Curtis. Cradle of Filth. Uh, Coffin Fodder. That is like one of the biggest hooks of a black metal song that I can think of. Are you listening to Pestilence? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Ah, uh, yeah. I don't recognize this one. You don't remember that one? Oh, mm. man. No. Nah. What year was that? 2006, Six. seven, yeah, 2006. Okay, coming up on his anniversary this next month. Nice. I saw what them once, that? I have no desire to see them again. <laughs> well, you wouldn't recognize any of them except for one guy, anyway. So, yeah, Michael Keane, it's always been Michael Keane and the faceless. Hey, Michael Keane, <laughs> no, not the actor either. I don't know. Maybe the actor is the actor. Is it Michael Keane the actor? Is he in no. in the faceless? Oh no! Oh, that sucks. Well, do you have anything else to say, Josh, about uh, 2010s in the absence of synth? I mean, like we've said with it the million, <laughs> like we've said with a million albums, it's good. Well, on paper, you know what I mean, like. It's it, it is well written, it is well executed. Like these are I don't know. This is this is proficient. It's it's well yeah. put together, <clears throat> but like you were saying, it lacks any hooks. Like the only things that I remember at all that stood out to me on this album was there was one weird like two-step riff that seemed out of place that I was just like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And then there was that one that I told you sounded like it was ripped straight from... Um, Answer Pass? Yeah, but from uh, Pneumonia Hawk. Oh, Pneumonia. Oh, okay. I didn't know. Yeah, and I'll have down, to track down, 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 down exactly the song with that riff so I can send it <laughs> to you, but... <laughs> now I'm just thinking about the music video. Hey, hey! <laughs> I think this album is still going to appeal to... 
a lot of people within the community. Oh my god. You know? I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to watch that music video now. <laughs> yeah, I, I just and it may just be a deal of like because I'm not big on this type of genre. I always feel like in the like the black metal, uh, your death core, you know, death metal, whatever, it's hard to really stand out. And again, this may just be like me because I'm not really into that genre of genres. It just feels very it just doesn't feel like you can like really stand out like you know, like like in a metal core or just in a rock, you know, genre or whatever. You know what I mean? Right, but I, I and I think it's to be honest with you, I think it is just me because I sit there a lot of times. I'm like, ah, oh, this all just sounds like the same to me, you know. Blast beat, blast beat, blast beat. <laughs> I don't think it's just you. We're I mean, more I think, than just blast beats. I think people, we're people, who we're human beings. Are you know? I've I've said a bunch. There's certain genres of music that's music for musicians you know yes that did and cross if you're, my mind too. you have to be somebody who's like tapped into that you know you've got to be a person who like either has a big appreciation for that kind of guitar work or for that kind of drum work um but then also curtis like it is hard to stand out in a sea of those kind of bands and True. the only way you do is like we just talked about with hooks, like you have to have an edge that brings people Oops. in because without that, you just, you got Abigail album. Williams was, was off the hook. Okay. He was, was there off. He was the off it. <laughs> um, otherwise you get an album like in the absence of light that while it's good, it doesn't stand out at all. You know? Yeah. Um yeah, but that being said, I'm I'm sure this was still a pretty popular album for them, you know. Oh yeah. Um yeah. I didn't really look at any of their streaming numbers, but you know, a lot of these these first few albums came out when the streaming game was not around. Right. Not very good. I mean not just good. looking not at good. their popular stuff yeah i mean their newest album probably has the most well yeah <laughs> and you, you're I only gonna that. get you're mostly curse gonna get an american audience on this like right. you're not getting crossover fans on this Oof. you're not the people who listen to cradle of filth are not gonna also listen to abigail williams most likely because it's an American take on black metal. Right. You know? Yeah. So yeah, I would like, assume a lot of these streaming numbers come from Americans. Yeah, it looks like Shadow of Thousand Suns is the, the most played, has the I most mean, plays on it. It looks like they have just not done very well on the streaming front overall. Um, yeah, I mean, 100,000, 200,000, like that's not anything on an album yeah. that's been out well, for 16 years. Some about almost 10, 000, less than 10,000 monthly listeners, 33,000 followers. And looking at their top listeners, I mean, this these top five are all American cities. So uh, their most recent yeah. one, Walk Beyond the Dark, it looks like uh, a bunch of people gave it a chance. Yeah. On I Will like, Depart. Eh. Uh, and then it fell to a fifth of the numbers uh, for the next track. <laughs> it's it's funny. You could like watch and you're like, we well, can watch it decrease slowly over time. <laughs> yeah. These are some long tracks, eight minutes, 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I feel like, you know, Last thoughts on this one. It just leaves a lot to be desired. Like you instantly bump this up a couple notches by having a synth in there. And with just a few hooks, you know, you, you could really take this album to another level. It started so strong. You know, it has, we have those weird, like, um, you know, the wolves howling in the background of the end of the first song. Like that's a hook. But then we follow that up with zero hooks for the rest of the album. So, where are the hooks? 
Yeah, and the bad thing is, I mentioned earlier, you get Ashley back on this next album, Becoming, but then you just lose her again and you don't replace her again. So it's kind of like, that's just like, I can already tell we're going to have a problem with that because now you're teasing me with, well, we're going back to synth, symphonic metal, you know, and then, oh, never mind, we're done with it. Yeah. What was no, the point? Not do that. <laughs> what was the point? Yeah, I mean, I if know. she's anything like, um, was it Kristen Hayford? I, um, Kristen something. Then it's probably a deal of like, she sees that this guy does not have his shit together and she comes back around when it seems like he does. <laughs> and then now we're not touring, we're not doing anything and it's going to be another few years until I decide to write an album. Right. So yeah. I think a lot of people dip because there doesn't seem to be any consistency here. Or longevity. They don't feel like there's a future. Right. Yeah. Well, that is 2010's In the Absence of Synth. Uh, drummer Ken Bedeen would be replaced by former drummer Zach Gibson. I mean, in or out, bro. Okay? <laughs> You're in or out. Oh, I'll yeah. come back for this one. Ah, uh, no, I'm out again. Yeah, oh, I'll come back for the next one. Nah, I'm out. Nah, I'm out. <laughs> uh, while the band would recruit bassist Griffin Wanawa. Jesse! Yeah, <laughs> uh, to fill the vacant spots. All right, that is going to do it on this episode. Our current lineup for the time being, don't get used to it, is Ken Sorcerer on a, a Ken Sorcerer on Bergeron on vocals and guitar, Ian Jekyllis on the let's guitar. just say Ken, let's just say Ken, uh, Griffin Wanawa on bass, and Zach Gibson on drums. Uh, I do have one final question before I you know, get your final thoughts on this segment of Abigail Williams of the three. I think I already know what the answer is, but of the three album artworks that we've talked about so far, which one's your favorite? Legend. No, oh, okay. It's like, is he really thinking about it? Yeah. Legend yeah, what for are, sure. What is it about uh, legend, dude? I mean, to it me, it is, fits that like raw kind of creepiness of the album too, like the music. It's the Raven or Crow is a little hard to tell here, right? Um, it's the gray sky, the full moon, um, the logo for their band name, Abigail Williams. This is the coolest way they have it. You know, you see it a couple different ways over the next couple albums. This is the coolest looking way. This looks like messed up black metal -y. Looks creepy. Yeah. What about you? Ah, uh, legend. Easily. Legend. Yeah. Although in the absence of synth looks kind of cool. It's like somebody's face and like roots. And, uh. <laughs> it looks like... Uh, uh, after man uh, <laughs> oh my was god it, uh ascension where he looks like super crazy or no it's decent they're, they're both like crazy. the same yeah <laughs> i mean i think dissensions yeah worse but yeah ah part five go ahead and get until vaxis three my friend until vaxis oh my gosh man um all right yeah final thoughts on uh this segment of abigail williams josh um, I mean, I'm just upset. I'm just upset that they they <laughs> won't nail down this uh this synth situation. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you got to think, man, when there's one guy doing a lot of this, I wonder this about um uh Corey Taylor a lot too. Is there an egomaniac element to these guys who are the only one who the band kind of cycles around? Um, are you talking about Corey Taylor from Slipknot? Or no. Uh, like, what? Uh, no, like, I'm talking some original, about... Um, Corey Putman? Put Putman? Yeah, 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 Putman. <laughs> who totally um, different guys? <laughs> Yeah, I you got I, I wonder if there's yeah. like kind of an ego there because that's how it was with the faceless. 
Like, you know, everybody wondered, what was the deal? Why, why is this going on? Well, come to find out, Michael Keane has this massive ego and nobody can work with him. Yeah. So is that the situation with our boy here, Ken? Um, is that the situation you, with Norma you might, Jean? You might you think know? the same thing with Scoggin, Josh. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Think about how many members and bands that he's been that he's gone through. I wonder sometimes about him because he is such an odd character. Yeah. I could see being in a band with him and that not being a good time. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, man. But yeah, I'm with you too. I do wonder that sometimes, like, okay, what's because I have thought that about Corey too. And I'm like, all right, like I want to think this guy is is a good guy, but some signs here you know with the, it's with like why chicks, won't like anybody saying. stay yeah why are you guys not staying <laughs> yeah exactly there's a reason i did see um they played furnace the final furnace fest uh at the beginning of this month and they played of course they played memphis laid waste they had Scoggin come back play it they had um scotty henry and uh that gummit. They had some of the original guys come back and actually play that song. So that was pretty cool to like see them do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway. All righty, let's uh get on out of here, Josh. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at is survived by pro for news and the latest episode postings, not just on this show, but other shows as well. We have the history of the course after hours podcast where I sit down with my good friend and avid listener of this very podcast, Eric. Then we discuss some of the bands me and Josh have already talked about. And at times, we surprise Josh. We anger him. We astonish him. Yeah. You blow my mind with your tits. <sighs> <laughs> we also have the Red Right Hand podcast, which has covered all six seasons. Soon to be a movie, because they are doing work. Did you see the picture I sent you? Aren't they the filming? Video? Maybe it was a video. Yes. I must say, there's a lot of pictures and videos coming out. Of like filming stuff, so it's pretty cool, man. We'll have an update for you here pretty soon, too. So be on the lookout for that episode. Well, we also have the Throne of the Dragon podcast, which has covered season one and season two. Sooner or later, season three of HBO's House of the Dragon. But in the meantime, we'll have season one of HBO's A Night of the Seven Kingdoms this next summer. But before that, we're going to do some reading to get prepared for that. But we're also going to have some character profiles eventually. <laughs> eventually. <laughs> oh, man. Also, while you're on Twitter, make sure to follow my co host at Joshua Lynn Gary. Make sure to leave us a five star review and write us a comment on whatever podcast service you're using. And if you want to listen to us and see our smiling faces, head on over to our YouTube page. Just search is Survive by Productions. That'll have every episode from all of our shows. Subscribe to the channel and thumbs up the video. Uh, yeah, it made me think. I was just uh, on my homepage here, or my desktop. I have a couple of pictures of Westeros maps. And mm. uh, I saw, I see them every once in a while, and I thought about it today. I was like, man, we haven't done a... The Throne of the Dragon podcast episode in like two months. It's like, dang, it feels like forever since we've talked about Westeros. I'm probably not going to know what the hell I'm talking about anymore. We're now, be talking, where's uh, King's Landing at? <laughs> we're going to be talking long before Raj the Dodge, Curtis. There was Raj Oro the, the Boro. Oro the Boro? Yeah, I like Raj the Dodge. Better. Yeah, Raj the Dodge is better. Yo, Raj, what up, Raj? <laughs> yeah. All right, until the next episode where we'll finish up talking about the band Abigail Williams, we'll see you.